One. You will hear someone giving instructions to staff at a festival. Listen carefully and answer questions one to three. Good morning everybody. I'd like to welcome you to the Castle Pop Festival. My name is Sandy and I'm the general manager of Castle Pop Entertainments and I just want to take a few moments to mention a few things to you before you go and have your detailed briefings in your work groups. Uh, you all have a copy of the plan of the festival grounds. Now most things are obvious but I'd like to point out first the visitor toilets here along the side of the main area. Kindly do not use these yourselves. Your own facilities, the staff toilets, are beside the breakfast tent. Also, there are public telephones behind the stage. I mention these two things because they are places that visitors often ask for. For yourselves, one of the most important places is the staff meeting point. This is new this year and the only thing to remember is that it exists and that when you refer to a meeting point between yourselves, you need to make clear which one you are talking about. The staff meeting point is between Campsite 1 and the disabled viewing area. This is not marked on the general maps, but it is marked on the maps you've got there. The visitors meeting point is, as you can see, in the centre of the main area, between the breakfast tent and the entrance. Now, another important facility is the first aid tent. This is a big round tent, so you can't miss it. It's on the right-hand side of the entrance, again as you come in. There are many other first aid facilities all over the festival site. In fact, there is a first aid box in every tent and sales point, but this is the central point. Finally, I wanted to mention the security on the site. Every year the festival gets bigger and bigger, and so every year we have to increase the security arrangements. We have a number of small security offices, one being near the entrance, but the main security office is opposite the disabled viewing area. It's next to the Old England pub so that the officers can keep an eye on what's going on there. And of course, in that office there is a full supply of first aid equipment too. And don't forget, those of you who can't wait till you get your pay at the end of the festival, there are some cash machines in the wall of the Old England pub. Now answer questions 4 to 10. I do hope you will enjoy working with us this year. It's always good to see some of last year's faces back with us again. We hope this year to put on an even better festival than before. The first year we put on a festival, we called it the Mountain View Pop Concert. <laughs> and it was a pop concert rather than a festival. We held it inside the castle and you could see the mountains in the background. It was very small and personal. Then we held it in front of the castle, with the castle in the background, and then we started calling it the Castle Festival. Now, this year, we have moved further away into the fields. The advantage is that the castle and the mountains are both there in the distance, but we have as much space as we want in the fields. The only problem with the fields is that sheep use the fields during the spring months and they leave little messages for us all over the place. So please be careful and encourage the visitors to be careful too. 
Now, it just remains for me to let you know the times of your detailed briefings, which are as follows. And I'm telling you these as they are not, I repeat, not as written down on your welcome letters. Those of you who are working on the children's zone, your meeting is at 2 p.m. in Campsite 2. Those of you on the security team need to meet behind the stage at 3.15 p.m. For the people on first aid, please do not meet in the first aid tent. There will not be enough room. But meet at the entrance gates at 4 p.m. Finally, we need everybody, and I do mean everybody, on duty on Monday morning at 8 a.m. for the final clean-up. I'd like to remind you that Monday is the final day of work, not the Sunday. People not coming to the final day will lose 50% of their pay. The meeting place for that is Campsite 1. Now, good luck! And let's make this the best festival ever! That is the end of part one. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turns to part two. Part two. You will hear a tour guide welcoming a group of visitors to the British Library and telling them about the library and what they will see there. First, you have some time to look at questions 11 to 15. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to your very own tour of the British Library on this lovely afternoon. My name is Tony Walters, and I'm your guide for today. Could I please see your tickets for the guided tour? I'd also like to remind you that any tickets bought today do not include a visit to the reading rooms. I'm afraid we don't do visits on Fridays, or any weekday during working hours, so as not to disturb the readers. But if you do want to see those rooms, the only day there are tours is on Sundays. So, I don't want anyone to be disappointed about that today. OK? Thank you. Right, we'll start with a brief introduction. As many of you know, this is the United Kingdom's National Library, and you can see that this is a magnificent modern building. It was first designed by Sir Colin St. John Wilson in 1977 and inaugurated by Her Majesty the Queen more than 20 years later in 1998. As you can see, the size is immense, and the basements alone have 300 kilometres of shelving, and that's enough to hold about 12 million books. The total floor space here is 100,000 square metres, and, as I'll show you, the library houses a huge range of facilities and exhibition spaces. And it has a thousand staff members based here in the building. So, you can appreciate the scale of our operation. In fact, this was the biggest publicly funded building constructed in the United Kingdom last century. It is still funded by the government as a national institution, of course, and it houses one of the most important collections in the world. The different items come from every continent and span almost 3,000 years. The library isn't a public library, though. You can't just come in and join and borrow any of the books. Access to the collections is limited to those involved in carrying out research. 
So it's really a huge reference library for that purpose, and anyone who wants to consult any materials that are kept here can formally apply to use the library reading rooms. You now have some time to look at questions 16 to 20. Right, well, here we are, standing at the meeting point on the lower ground floor, just to the right of the main entrance. I've given you all a plan of the building so that we can orientate ourselves and get an idea of where we'll be going. Now, outside the main entrance, you'll see the wide piazza with the stunning sculpture of Newton. The sculptor was Paolozzi but it's based on the famous image by William Blake, and it's definitely worth a closer look. On the other side of the piazza from the statue is the conference centre, which is used for all kinds of international conventions. We'll take a quick look inside at the end of our tour. Looking ahead of us now, you'll see that we're standing opposite the staircase down to the basement, where you'll find the cloakroom. And to the left of that, we have the information desk, where you can find out about any current exhibitions, uh, the times of the tours, and anything you need to know, if you don't have a tour guide. As you can see, on this lower ground floor, we also have a bookshop. That's the area over to the left of the main entrance. You'll be free to browse there when we get back to the ground floor. Now, opposite the main entrance on this floor, we have the open stairs leading up to the upper ground floor. And at the top of them, in the middle of the upper ground floor, you can see a kind of glass-sided tower that rises all the way up through the ceiling and up to the first floor. This is called the King's Library. It's really the heart of the building. It was built to house the collection that was presented to the nation in 1823 by the King. You can see it from every floor above ground. When we go up there, you'll find the library's treasures gallery on the left. Uh, can you find it on your plan? That's the exciting one. So we'll be visiting that first, but we'll also take a look at the stamp display situated behind it on the way to the cafe. Uh, a lot of people miss that. The cafeteria runs along the back of the floor and in the right-hand corner, you'll find the lifts and toilets. <laughs> Always good to locate them. The other main area on that floor is the public access catalogue section. And I'll show you how that operates when we get up there. That is the end of part two. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now it turns to part three. Part three. You will hear part of a talk about attending a science festival. First, you have some time to look at questions 21 to 25. Now, I think nearly all of you have received confirmation of your school placements for next term. And as part of your activities, we will be asking you to take responsibility for promoting a school visit to the Norchester Science Festival.
Of course, the head of science at your school will be aware of the festival and should have all the details of it, but all the heads of science at your schools will be looking to you to be the main organiser and motivator of a visit to the festival. They'll give you the documents you need. We hope that you will motivate pupils at your schools to take an interest in the festival. It runs for three days. There are day tickets and special three-day tickets, and schools have the extra option of a two-day ticket. We hope you will encourage your pupils to visit it on one or two days. But most important of all, we hope you will use the festival to generate a lively interest in science that will last all year round and provide the school with a lasting benefit. This will, with luck, lead to improved examination results in science subjects. And let's not forget, we hope your pupils will have a lot of fun too. Needless to say, your performance in achieving these aims will count towards your final exam grade at the end of the year. Now, let me just say a few words on why a science festival. Science is part of our everyday world in a way that is different now from before. Of course, we are used to having the benefit of scientific inventions. We are used to the aeroplane, the motor car, the space rocket and so on. But now we live in a truly scientific age, which means one where inventions and improvements are matters of routine rather than occasional and unusual events. We have become a really scientific society. Yet we find that we are failing to interest and enthuse the young in this. Fewer young people are choosing to study science at school after the age of 16 and even fewer at university. As a result, we have fewer teachers coming into schools to teach science. And many science teachers are not teaching their specialism. For example, I know of several cases where maths is being taught by biologists and chemistry is being taught by physicists. We urgently need another 3,000 science teachers in England at least. That's why we look to you, the science teachers who are starting off your careers, to inject enthusiasm and wonder into the study of science. And we hope the Norchester Festival will help you to do this. Before you hear the rest of the talk, you have some time to look at questions 26 to 30. Now, enough of the background. What about the festival? There are three main venues where the festival events take place. These are the Millennium Library, the Town Hall, not the Town Hall itself, but the Town Hall Conference Centre, and the Norchester Theatre. Now, when you are planning your visits, remember that many of the activities for younger pupils will be at the Millennium Library, and the secondary school pupils may find more to interest them in the conference centre. Now, just so that you have some immediate information, I'd like to mention a few of the events that are taking place this year. One event of special interest to people living in this area is called Waterworld. This is a clay model of the southeast of England, and the presenters show you the effects of rising sea levels as a result of climate change. They ask the audience to select the rise in sea level, for example, 20 or 40 or 60 centimetres, and the model shows the places that would be flooded as a result. Watch out for your town. Does it sink or does it swim? Transport 2050 is about transport options for our towns in the future. A number of experts will introduce the topic and then everyone at the event will have a chance to speak and give their views. 
Science in a Suitcase is a comedy act by two scientists who do crazy experiments and sing songs and play the clown to large audiences every afternoon. I'm particularly looking forward to that one, which should be entertaining. Ropes and Hangings is an interactive event which will be of interest to young people in which, after experimenting with ropes and bricks, they build a real suspension bridge. That kind of hands-on activity is always really popular. And, appealing to a different audience, there is Paper and Time, in which some experts will be showing us the techniques they use for the conservation of ancient books and manuscripts. This will obviously not be for everybody, but it should be interesting just to see how they do it. Now, let's move on to tickets and transport to the festival. That is the end of part three. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now it turns to part four. Part four. You will hear a talk about chocolate. Good morning everyone. Today my talk is going to be about chocolate. I'm going to talk a little bit about the history of chocolate. But first, I'm going to tell you a story about Julia Proctor. She eats her favourite food. She feels guilty. She knows that chocolate has a lot of fat and sugar. But Julia says she is addicted to chocolate. And once she starts eating it, she can't stop. Julia isn't the only one who is addicted to chocolate. It is a favourite food for people all over the world. And in a survey of 16 different countries, people preferred chocolate to ice cream, cakes and cookies. In the United States, chocolate is a $10 billion industry. For Valentine's Day, for example, people spend over $400 million on chocolate. The idea of eating chocolate didn't begin until the 19th century. Before that, people drank chocolate. The custom began in Central America, where the Aztecs drank bowls of chocolate to stay alert. When the liquid chocolate was brought to Spain in the 1500s, people thought it was medicine because it tasted bitter like other medicines. In fact, the people who made chocolate into drinks were either druggists or doctors. Then people discovered that mixing chocolate with sugar made a wonderful drink. King Ferdinand of Spain loved this drink so much that he put out an order. Anyone who talked about chocolate outside the court would be killed. So, for about 100 years, chocolate was a secret in Spain. But finally, people found out about chocolate and it became a popular drink throughout Europe. In the 1800s, a British chocolate maker discovered a way to make chocolate smooth and velvety. Then the Swiss added milk to the chocolate. Today, most Americans prefer milk chocolate, while most Europeans prefer dark chocolate. Now research shows that chocolate is actually good for us because chocolate has a variety of vitamins and minerals and it has more than 300 different chemicals. One chemical works on the part of the brain that feels pleasure. People who feel good when they eat chocolate are actually healthier because feeling pleasure is important for health and could protect against illness. Good chocolate doesn't have much fat or sugar. 
You can enjoy it if you eat a little at a time. So, thinking about Julia Proctor, who I mentioned at the beginning, if you just eat a little at a time, that isn't a big problem. That's the end of my talk on chocolate. That is the end of part four. You now have half a minute to check your answers. You're never gonna make it, you're not good enough There's a million other people with the same stuff You really think you're different, man, you must be kidding Think you're gonna hit it, but you just don't get it It's impossible, it's not probable, you're irresponsible Too many obstacles, you gotta stop it, yo You gotta take it slow, you can't be a pro Don't waste your time no more Who the fuck are you to tell me what to do? I don't give a damn if you say you disapprove I'm gonna make my move, I'm gonna make it soon And I'll do it cause it's what I wanna fucking do Cause all these opinions and all these positions They come in in millions, they blocking your vision But no, you can't listen, that shit is all fiction Cause you hold the power you're as long as you're dreaming make it. There's no way that you make it And maybe you can fake it But you're never gonna make it Aren't you just gonna take that? Make them take it all back Don't tell me you believe that Aren't you just gonna take that?